Welcome to Builders and Bricksters, where we where we chat about uh, data architecture, how folks are using Databricks, and just the, the overall data ecosystem in the field. I'm joined by Brendan Frick today, who is from GumGum, Gum, to talk to us about some of the ways that they use data in their business. Do you want to introduce yourself, Brendan? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I can introduce myself. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Brendan. Um, I am the engineering manager of data at GumGum. Gum. I've been at the company for about a year and a half, but you know, before that, I've been kind of using Spark for most of my career, um, as well as you know, Spark, Python, Scala, a lot of the database tools that people are familiar with. And um, yeah, excited to talk more about that today. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time to chat. I am Garen Staubley. I'm a solutions architect with Databricks. Uh, been around for about four years now, and uh, really excited. I love to talk to customers and work through some of these things, just have kind of a, a candid conversation with a bunch of questions, follow-up, randomness, uh, maybe some some humor here and there. So I think, Brennan, just to kind of set the set the stage here, so, so tell us a little bit about like GumGum. Gum. What, what is GumGum? Gum? What do y'all do? What are the problems you're trying to solve like data-wise? Yeah, so uh, GumGum Gum is a, an ad platform and uh, our goal is to really connect advertisers who have a product or service that they want to sell, advertise. Um, you know, they might want to put it on web pages or they might want to, um, you know, advertise on a video or, a, a, or a, even like something like a video game is something that we're, we're starting to support. What GumGum Gum is trying to do is is make that connection between the advertiser and the target target audience without using any user data. So instead we're relying on contextual information. Um, you know, what is that page that they're looking at? And we use a lot of cool ML models, CV, NLP to really understand that. Um, but then also understanding, um, you know, what type of creative uh, is going to lead to us actually getting, you know, that person's attention, creating a better experience for the user who's getting ads that, that really speak to them as, as a person without actually knowing anything about them as a person. Um, and also for the, the advertiser who can reach, reach clients in this kind of data privacy post cookie, uh, cookie list world. So. so it sounds very contextual, the, the data that you're working with yeah. and, and the way that you have to decide is very contextual kind of understanding and, and being situationally aware of what, what customers would, or what users kind of on these pages and these apps, the content they're looking at and kind of introspectively understanding maybe where their head's at and to how those ads would, would be important to them. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we, I, I personally think about it, like trying to tell a story. Um, you know, this is a person that is looking at this thing and, and really how can we describe that story as much as possible without intervening in that person's personal search history, which we think is something that, that should stay personal. And so like, what is the data itself? Like, how, how are you working with the, the data, the, the landscape, if you will, you know, architecturally, the challenges that you face, like, help us understand you as a, as an engineering manager for, for, for the data industry, engineering world, what does that look like for you? How do you, how do you work with data? Yeah. So our, our data, um, like 90% of our data, um, comes from this one source. That's what we'll be kind of talking about today. And that's, that's really our, our ad exchange system. So um, our ad exchange is the brain and the executor. It's, it's basically this huge chatterbox out on the internet that's just talking to all these different, different players in the ad tech ecosystem. So it's making requests to inventory, um, people who have like, or, uh, publishers who have pages and videos that, that are getting hosted. Uh, it's, it's communicating with programmatic partners uh, so people that have um, campaigns that they want to run programmatically, um, it's just make, making billions of requests uh, every day to, to really be the brains of, of our ad tech operations. And so that's our data set is all these different requests. So we end up with probably four different domains of logs uh, and probably somewhere between 20 and, and 40 types of log, like actual like entities that we're, we're logging. And so we want to bring that data from our ad exchange system into a place where we can make it live, you know, make it available to the clients, um, make it available to our business users, and also um, cleanly integrate it with with all of our, our systems, um, so either feedback loop or also co coordinating with a lot of our operational systems as well. So how how, how does GumGum Gum use data, uh, like the contextual data, like data architecture wise? Yeah. So, so our journey starts in Kafka. 
Um, we have our ad exchange, you know, publish these these event types to different Kafka topics. And after you know, at Kafka, we, we make a split into real time data and our batch data. So for our batch data, we have um, a, a whole, like 45 different um, Databricks jobs or workflows with a Spark app. And that Spark app is basically reading the Kafka data, which has been put in S3 via Kafka Connect. Uh, and then it's taking that data, transforming it from either JSON or Avro and structuring it into like a tabular format, uh, doing some validation, applying some business logic, applying some kind of functional logic, um, doing all sorts of, of data structuring, kind of your, your raw processing steps and ultimately putting it in a, into a uh, CSV format that we can push into our data warehouse. Um, on the other side of things, we uh, on the streaming side, we're connecting uh, some Spark streaming and structured streaming apps hosted in Databricks directly to the Kafka topic and doing the same sort of transformations, um, much thinner though, uh, because it's, it's data that's um, a little more expensive for us to process. And that data also lands in the same format that's compatible with our uh, data warehouse. And then from our data warehouse, we make the data accessible in Looker where we can build all sorts of uh, explorers, different experiences, um, things that we can either show directly to internal or external users, or we can even just embed in applications. We can send file transfers and really use that as kind of our hub for getting people access to the data at that point. Cool. I'm really curious about like the way that you process the batch data on Databricks and the fact that you're, you're bringing this data in from Kafka Connect. And so these are, these are some sort of compressed files, JSON structure, presumably, uh, that you're using. So historically JSON, but our, our newer pipelines and soon to be all our pipelines are going to be Avro. Okay. And then like the schemas themselves, are you going to get that through schema registries? How are you even like detecting changes as the data comes through, say in Avro? Yeah. So for, for the batch pipelines, um, we were, these are pretty old pipelines. Um, these are, I don't know, some of them have commits from 2016, I think. Um, so a lot of these were built, uh, they're still RDD pipelines and they use, uh, the Java objects that the ad exchange uses when they actually build these, these JSON objects. So we actually just use their getters and to, to pull the data and then assemble that in the RDD and the Avro files, um, you know, we're going to move to more of a, you know, modern data frame, kind of more SQL API type of approach. Yep. Okay. So using our yeah, one of the with custom object types. Yeah, exactly. And then from like, the way that Databricks is being used in both like the, the, the Kafka side, or sorry, the Kafka Connect side with, with, the, with the files in S3, JSON, Avro, and then the streaming side connecting directly to Databricks. How are you processing that data? Is it using uh, like Parquet, ORC, Avro, Delta? Yeah, so it's, it's mostly JSON files. Um, that's our, our legacy logs are all JSON. And and so for those ones, um, we actually reuse the, the event producer, which is the ad exchange, uh, has their Java libraries that have all the getters and setters for those. And we actually just implement those in RDD. Um, so we're building these custom objects using these getters um, and building our RDD that way and then process it um, in Spark and, and do a couple of, of aggregations and, and transformations. Um, for our newer pipelines, though, so we're switching to Avro um, for a couple of reasons, but one of the big reasons is so we can get um, a schema encoded in those objects and we can start using data frames to directly interact um, with our data sets and process the data sets. Um, so that'll be okay. similar and we're still interacting with the batch files, but it'll just be with Avro readers and then actually using the Avro schema uh, and some of the metadata in that schema that we encode and use that to drive the transform instead of having to code it in Spark specifically. So in its current state, you're kind of using that, that get up, get, get setter, get and setters, getters and setters in your kind of RDD pipelines, moving more toward like the schema inferencing from, from Avro in the future, leveraging data frames, presumably with, with that 
in mind uh, from a, like the Spark perspective, moving away from RDDs more toward like the data frame style. Yeah, and and we're already there for like some of our largest pipelines. What is it that that you found has has really been valuable about using Databricks? Like any operational burden reductions or you know boosting productivity, faster time to value, etc. Yeah, so I think one of I, yeah, the operational value is probably the first thing I'd mention. Um, you know, before we were on Databricks, we were a, a Spark shop, like we used Spark. Um, and so really, I think the biggest value for us is finding a home for Spark, <laughs> you know, in a way that we we can really offload that that overhead of, of managing your Spark infrastructure, of troubleshooting your Spark jobs as they fail, um, of every time you add a job, you know, being able to, to manage that pretty easily. Again, we had, when I joined, I think we had four data engineers managing, you know, 45 plus Spark jobs on top of like all the other architectures we managed. And the key to that is really being able to, to quickly see everything, as I mentioned before. So I think really having that, that, that kind of console view of Spark um, and that, that kind of quick deployment, if, if we, I guess a common thing for us is we have seasonal inventory patterns. So, you know, the last four weeks have been, you know, really high traffic on the internet. And so being able to quickly scale up all our jobs without like having a, a, to drop everything else we're doing um, is, is, is something that's really important to us. Um, the other half though, I think with Databricks that maybe is a more common pattern um, or, or something that I hear talked about more is, is that quick exploration. So, um, you know, we have a lot of, we call them deep dive, data deep dive requests. It started off as one request. Now it's like a year long series basically where, you know, our users have questions about their data that's not readily available in these, these big pipelines we build. And so being able to grab a notebook, grab a cluster and just start asking those questions of the data um, is something that brings, you know, pretty immediate value to the business. And it really helps, you know, justify why we're processing these big data sets in the first place. So what are what are some of the best tips or most salient tips you can you know, offer for others who might be looking to replicate your success? Like what are best practices you've had and you've seen really employ to give you more scalable, you know, higher experimentation velocity and yet maintain that robust dynamic of handling all this different type, all these different types of data? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's tough to give a tip for every use case. Like I, I know, I think I can give a tip on, on how to operate a lot of data, both in depth and volume with a lean team. And, and I think, you know, that would really be, you know, focusing and it's, it's something that gets talked about a lot, but focusing on, on repeatable architectures and maintainable architectures. Um, so whenever we build something new, you know, we're really focused on, on developing patterns and practices that, that help us, just easily replicate it. You know, we really try to look at how much code are we writing when we have to do this a second time or a third time? How much testing do we have to do the second or third time? Um, so a lot of our Spark apps, you know, we use a, a strong object-oriented model. We have, you know, a lot of inheritance, a lot of um, composition. You know, we're really focused on, on building things that are going to get used again um, and using patterns that, that really facilitate that. The other thing I guess I would give is, is especially for lean teams is, is like transitioning from observation to action is a big thing too. So um, I, f I feel like there's probably a ton of data engineering teams that, you know, get tons of alerts. Uh, they get 16 notifications when their data doesn't look right. Um, and that's good, I, I think, to start, but you want to thin that down into to every time you receive one of these alerts, you should be able to do something about it. Otherwise, it's just taking time, energy, and, and focus from, from engineers that really need to be like always actioning and always either working on feature work or, or, or fixing a tangible problem. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, Brendan. I uh, we'll just want to close out here and, and really be appreciative of, of the time that you've spent and helping us understand Gum Gum, your journey, some of the challenges you faced, how you've overcome them. The, the benefits that you've seen and uh, thank you all for watching the builders and bricksters there will be more videos to come